How's it going, guys? Mike here on the Trust Us Collectibles channel, here with Randall, aka Shizu Cats. How's it going, guys? And today, we are bringing you guys a deck overview for the newly released 7 Deadly Sins, the 10 Commandments set. This, kind of like AOT Final Season, is another English original expansion set. But unlike Attack on Titan, the expansion for this set also was an English original. So 7 Deadly Sins set 1 was original, and this expansion set is also original. So completely brand new English only cards. Uh, never before seen cards being tested for the first time. Um, so the, lots of new climax combos, lots of new utility cards, lots of things to test. So we're going to be breaking down what we tested so far, showing you guys some of the cool deck ideas that we've come up with, and just going over them briefly and letting you guys know uh, all about them. Yeah, so unlike the first set of Seven Deadly Sins, I feel like this one really expanded the horizons on what was available for the set with regards to things like, uh, especially Climax combos. I feel like Climax combos were one thing from the first set that uh, were quite limited in terms of your viable options that you could choose from. So with the second set, with so much new material to work with, we're really excited to get into some of these decks and let you guys know what we've been trying. So... Yeah. Uh, for the first deck that we're going to be looking at, I think that this is probably uh, one of the decks that is on most people's radar as far as, um, like, I guess a sort of, like, best build that a lot of people are looking forward to playing, and that is the Stock Soul with Choice Escanor build. So, uh, this deck utilizes the brand new Escanor top end, which I think a lot of people are designating as, like, the kind of standout top end of the set uh, before any testing has been done. Uh, this Escanor has a very unique ability where he can take his soul damage and then split it into multiple instances of one instead of it just being one big instance of like three or four. And so the way this Climax combo works is you attack with the Choice Climax and then you pay one and discard the specific Escanor level zero, which is a very powerful level zero profile in itself, uh, having that sort of like Aqua Riki type profile. So... The way that we want to synergize this Escanor combo is by utilizing Stock Soul triggers. So there are multiple Stock Soul Climax combos available between both Seven Deadly Sins set 1 and 2, and the one that we've chosen is the level 2 Meliodas from the second set. So the main reason behind this Stock Soul synergy is because of Escanor's restriction on his Climax combo, where when he attacks, he can only pay the cost if his soul is 4 or less, at the time of activation. However, if he triggers ex extra soul triggers after the cost has already been paid, then that will count as additional instances of one once he actually goes in to do soul damage. So you can pay the cost, trigger stock soul, and then do five or even six instances of one with a single attack, which is very, very strong. The Meliodas combo that we've chosen is a 2-1 early play, uh, somewhat similar to the Gil Thunder that we've seen from the first set of Seven Deadly Sins. And uh, his Climax combo lets you sack the Climax in order to salvage two at the Encore step. So he kind of works in a very similar way, but because of the color, him also being yellow, it just kind of streamlines the whole uh, deck building process and uh, allows us to play some pretty good yellow cards, such as the new level one Meliodas that can clone himself and give us a bit more consistency in our mid game. Uh, now, uh, speaking of the mid-game, uh, another level 2 option that we have chosen to adapt from the new set is the Arthur mid-game. So this is a pretty powerful level 2, where he's just 1500 base power, but as long as you have any Merlin on stage, he becomes 10,000 power with Han Encore, and he also has 2 base soul, making him a really nice attacker during the mid-game that we can put on the board for a fairly cheap cost. Uh, now, just taking a look at a couple last details to synergize with our Escanor endgame. Uh, we do have a couple cards in the Gil Thunder level 3 Bouncer from the first set, as well as the Merlin 1-1 from the second set. These cards can allow you to add extra soul to your Escanors, as well as manipulate the top few cards of your deck via the Gil Thunder in order to determine exactly what you're going to be triggering to know when you want to attack with the Escanor and maximize the power of that Climax combo. So this is just the sort of uh, shell that we have put together for the deck. Uh, we think it's a really fun deck and very satisfying if you can pull off those really neat combinations for your endgame. Uh, it does have a little bit of issues with 
uh, with regards to sculpting, as you do need to get a lot of copies of both the Escanor and that level 0 Escanor in order to discard for the cost. But if you can get all the pieces together, it's definitely a really satisfying end game to play with. So uh, next up, we'll have Mike talking about a deck of his own creation, which is a very unique spin on a set one deck with the Meliodas level three. Take it away, Mike. Yep. So our next deck is standby choice, but it runs six standby and only two choice. Now, set one of Seven Deadly Sins only had one set of standby, so... The standby climax combo from set 1 is a 1-0 that allows you to pay 1 to stand one of your characters. So it's not necessarily super impressive and only running 4 standby is not necessarily very conducive to being able to trigger a lot of standbys. But with set 2, now that we have extra pairs of standbys, alongside this new standby combo actually being a really valuable and powerful climax combo, I feel like this strategy can work out quite well. So how this deck works essentially is you want to stand by out a lot of the level 3 Meliodas at level 2. And how you can do that is starting at level 0, we have this new Brainstorm, Elaine Revived. Uh, she has a very unique Brainstorm effect, where normally Brainstorms are pay 1 and rest self to uh, mill X and, uh, and do whatever effect. However, the this Elaine sacrifices one of your other characters, sends them from stage to waiting room on top of tapping herself, in order to activate her Brainstorm effect, where you can top check up to 3 and add any card per Climax hit. So in order to synergize with this effect, we're running a lot of powerful cards with on-play abilities that allow you to try to either increase your chances of hitting Brainstorm or allow you to recycle the Brainstormer to do it again. So things like the level 0 Elaine filter from set 1, which is basically a carbon copy of the Trial Deck Toka card, if you guys are familiar with the 8 standby Data Live deck, as well as the new level 0 Meliodas, which allows you to pitch a card on play to reveal the top card of your deck, and you can salvage any level X or lower. Especially useful given that the card you usually want to salvage the most is the Elaine Brainstorm herself, being a level 0, you'll always be able to get her. So the four standby climaxes are for the Elaine Brainstorm, where when you play that climax, you can actually salvage this 2-2 Bond Hand Encore to, to your hand. So while that may seem a bit counterintuitive, the simple fact that you actually just get to have a plus one for every copy of the Elaine Brainstorm you have on board when you play this climax makes it so that you, have, you can recur your hand size and refill uh, your hand back up, um, despite the fact that you are essentially sacrificing a character every time you brainstorm. And then the following turn, you're very easily able to get rid of these 2-2 bricks in your hand through another copy of the Elaine level 0, for example, who can single-handedly discard two copies. So this deck, even on your very first turn, can start going really ham with the brainstorms, trying to mill through a bunch of your deck, find a bunch of standbys in your hand and start playing standby every turn. You bring out these 1-1-7-5 hand on court bonds. Uh, we can utilize the 1-1 one, one Elizabeth Field Swapper that is very like the 1-1 one, one Yoshino Field Swapper from Data Live. And then the goal is just to get through level 0 and level 1 with a pretty solid deck state and a solid clock uh, full of, you know, your level 3 standby targets like the Meliodas. And then once you get to level 2, it's go time with the 3-2 Meliodas, and then you can hard play down a 2-1 Elizabeth, supporting the Meliodas so he becomes 14k and hexproof. And the piece de la resistance for this new build is this new 2-1 Elizabeth counter, where she's a 2-5 counter, but when you use her backup effect, you can discard a Britannia from your hand, in order to give a 3-2 Meliodas specifically in battle the effect where the character across them gets minus 2 soul. So on top of the Meliodas and Elizabeth support offering a 14k untargetable and anti-burn lane, you also now have the ability to start negging soul on that lane as well. And all of this you can start doing at level 2. We run the two extra choice, trigger, choice triggers just for the Climax combo because that is essentially your only way of finishing the game. You play the Climax and you attack with a couple of Meliodas and hopefully on the swing back you can do the extra ping twos. Um, one extra thing to note about this deck I would say is that um, it's a very weird deck to play because again the Elaine Brainstorm sacrifices another character so you're minusing one every time you Brainstorm. So the deck takes a lot of getting used to. And sometimes, if you don't hit your brainstorms, 
then you can start running out of hand pretty quickly. So that's why we're running a, copy, a couple copies of the level zero S corner that we saw in the previous build, the aqua profile that allows you to just re-sculpt hand uh, and fill back, up, fill back up. And then also this level one Elaine, which has two effects that actually activate both on play and on death. Where on play, you can look at the top card of your deck and either leave it there or mill it. And also the effect where you can pay two and salvage a character. And both of these effects you can activate both on play and on death. So even this one card, if you have just extra stock from not using any stock, you can just essentially pay four and salvage two characters. You can play the Elaine, pay two, salvage, and then pop the Elaine using the Elaine Brainstorm. And then the one zero will allow you to top check again, and then you can pay two again. It's a very fun deck, uh, still working out the kinks of it, but I think there's definitely a lot of potential to be had with this uh, standby Melly Otis show. For our next deck, we have a new take on the Hendrickson endgame, this time with a new Climax combo from set two. So why don't you get, uh, tell us all about this deck, Randall? Sure, so this next deck we're looking at utilizes the new Merlin level one combo from the second set. So she's a 1-0-6k, and her Climax combo activates when you play the gate. If she's in the front row, you choose one of your characters and you give it on attack, pay one twin drive, as well as the ability where when it gets front attacked during your opponent's next turn, you can return the character back to your hand. So this is a pretty um, more modern spin on these sort of bounce back effects. Uh, it's, I think, probably the second time in Weish Wars between both languages that we've seen a version that allows you to assign the bounce back to one of your characters, which makes it quite powerful. Uh, that being said, typically, we are going to be having this Merlin target herself a lot of the time, just so that we can bounce her back to our hand, keep her safe, and allow her to keep reusing that Climax combo on future turns. And this is accomplished with the help from the Pants Climaxes, uh, which we are running with our level 3 line. That will allow us to get back the Gate Climax for repeated turns of Merlin combo again and again. And then we can use the Twin Drive element of her Climax combo in order to pay out those Climaxes, and make sure that our stock is nice and clean. So overall, this level one strategy isn't super unique, but it is quite powerful uh, nonetheless, just being able to repeatedly get this level one combo onto the board and just retain the same body over and over again. And then eventually, once you hit level two, we are going back into that Merlin strategy, or that Arthur strategy rather, uh, from the first deck that we looked at, where we have the two one Arthur. Uh, now, one card that we didn't mention earlier is the 1-1 one, one Merlin Support. Uh, this is a card that allows you to pretty seamlessly go between your level 1 into level 2 transition. So, apart from being a level assist, she has a couple extra abilities. Uh, the first one is that when you play a Climax, you may mill the top card of your deck, and if it is a level 1 or higher card, you can give one soul to one of your characters. Uh, this is something that we, uh, we mentioned as part of the Escanor strategy. Uh, but in this deck, we really care about that third ability where, uh, as an act, you can rest the Merlin and discard any Merlin character from your hand in order to salvage either an Arthur or Escanor. So uh, in this particular deck, because the Merlin combos are going to be bouncing back to our hand uh, with the Climax combo, once we hit level 2, we can discard those copies that we don't need anymore in order to transition into our level 2 Arthur game. And just like in the first deck, we can use this Arthur to have a really nice hold on the level 2 mid game as, as we transition into our level 3 Hendrickson. So the Hendrickson, uh, his climax combo is on attack. We can pay 1, discard 2 in order to look at the top card of our deck. We can either leave it there or send it to the waiting room if it's a climax and then burn four afterwards. So uh, this represents a pretty high damage ceiling. And because the Climax combo doesn't require a whole lot of stock, but it does require a pretty large amount of hand, it does synergize quite well with our Arthur mid game where we can utilize the stock uh, to invest in this big Arthur body on our board that we hopefully will not have to replace because, uh, because of how high power he is. And that allows us to transition quite well into our Hendrickson late game. Apart from that, we're running a lot of uh, pretty standard pieces throughout the rest of the deck. Uh, we have like things like the one of Dreyfus uh, in the level 3 line. We have 
uh, level 2 bomb at level 2. Just sort of odds and ends that can address specific threats along the way. But our main game plan is, for the most part, going to be using our Merlin into our Arthur into our Hendrickson. It's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty clear, clean-cut strategy, and uh, it does its job quite well. So, with that being said, next up we have a deck that is not exactly following normal game plans. It's uh, It's got a level 0 combo, which is not something that we see very often. So, our next one that we're going to be looking at utilizes the brand new Elizabeth combo. So, Mike, why don't you go ahead and let them know about this creation of yours that you've come up with. Yep. So this deck I've built is Stock Soul Gold Bar, utilizing the new double rear Elizabeth Brainstorm that also climax combos with the Stock Soul, where when you play the climax, you can you mill the top card of your deck, and then you can salvage a level extra lower character equal to or lower the the card uh, the milled card's level. And then she also is just a tap self salvage brainstorm. The level three combo for the Deanne Gold Bar is, uh, she's an early play. If you have three or more green cards in memory, she gets minus one level in hand. And then Climax Combo, when the Friend's Gold Bar is played, uh, and she's in the center slot, or so the front stage, um, you can either summon any character from Waiting Room, or you can burn one damage, and then she gets 1500 cross turn. So, Looking at the set in terms of its set design, I think it was very clear that they really wanted to try to push 8 gold bar. Um, the level 1 king combo requires you to have a green card in memory for him to get power. Um, and then there's also like a level 2 king support that um, uh, helps you filter your gold bars when you trigger them and also helps uh, buff your character's cross turn. So like for example, that 2-1 king can buff the Deanne to a 13k cross turn. However, needing a reverse and on top of needing a green card in memory for that king level one is kind of sketchy. So instead what I've done is I've just chosen a rather uninteractive combo to go with the level zero Elizabeth. So to help us achieve that game plan, we're running four copies of the clean cut Meliodas from set one, synergizing really well with that Elizabeth so you can play Elizabeth, have her attack in the front row and use the Meliodas 3-5 clean cut to have her move back row so you can safely use her to brainstorm or yet play another combo next turn. Uh, we also play a full set of the level one Meliodas that you guys saw in our previous deck with the, Eliz with the uh, Meliodas level two. In this deck, he is no less worse Arguably even more crucial for the role that he provides, being a one card in your hand that allows you to pitch any card to immediately summon another 1-0 from your hand. This deck is very top and heavy, so there are going to be a lot of cards that you would rather not see in your hand at level 1. Um, the Meliodas having the uh, top check 2 on attack effect also really works well with triggering gold bar. Once you get to level 1, you'll want to try to get a gold bar in your hand in preparation for level 2, and being able to tr look at two cards to see which one you want to trigger really helps you with the percentages of triggering that gold bar. In terms of the green cards that we need to send to memory in order to activate the Deanne, we run a full set of the Deanne Double Rare, which on reverse, she can pay one clock yourself and send herself to memory to look at up to the top three cards of her deck and at any character you see. She also has a alarm effect where when she is on the top of your clock, if you have another copy of herself in memory already, at the start of your main phase, you can discard any card and look at up to the top three cards of your deck and add up to one of any character. So again, helping you hand filter, getting the pieces that you need at the current time and filtering out whatever you high level characters you don't need. The second card that goes to memory is the level zero Hellbram, which just has a very simple effect where you can pay one and rest yourself to be able to top check three and uh, pay one and send to memory, excuse me. Pay one, send to memory to look at up to the top three and add any character or event. So this is really important because we do run four events. So we can add any of those and, and then add it to our hand. Gives us some extra uh, hand filter of being able to mill our deck a bit faster. And then the last card that goes to memory here is the Fairy King's Forest which we can only play at level 2, but it is a very strong event indeed. It's a 2-0 event where uh, you can either salvage any character from your waiting room, or you can choose a character from your waiting room and put it into stock, and then you can give one of your characters 1500 cross turn. So, 
This is primarily used for the salvage effect, um, but either way, whichever mode you go with, when you use this event, if you have two or less memory, you can send this card to memory. So if you have a combination of the Hellbram and then two events, that works for your three or more uh, green of memory, one DN and one Hellbram and the, and the event works. Uh, the event also has a bonder, which is very nice in the level zero fairy. Um, well, I think she's a fairy. I'm not quite sure. But the level zero uh, on play allows you to pitch any card to uh, salvage the event from your waiting room. So once you get to level two, you start playing a bunch of your level three DNs, which you can very easily sculpt through, you know, the Elizabeth Climax combo and the two zero event. And then the idea is you present a lot of really, you know, just regular size level threes, a lot of 10k level threes. But then if your opponent doesn't deal with them, you get to start playing Golbar over and over and over again. And depending on what you want to do, you can either uh, start burning a lot with the DM ping ones, or you can keep summoning uh, these uh, summon targets. So these other level threes all synergize with the DM climax combo, where the Meliodas heals on play from hand or from the effect of the DM summon. The Elizabeth also heals on play or from the effect of the Dian summon, and then the King has uh, on play or from the effect of Dian summon, he can clock kick. So if the Dians are left unanswered, you are able to just repeatedly play the Meliodas and Elizabeth over and over again at level 2 and start heal looping. Kind of how, uh, if players are familiar with Hollow Life production, the Rusha deck has the ability to summon a bunch of Marines over and over. This is kind of the same idea. And then the Meliodas also happens to be a very aggressive finisher as well, where he can on attack pay 2 and discard 2 Britannia to get 2000 power, and on reverse of his battle opponent, he can burn 4. And then to final round of the deck, we run a good amount of level 2 counters to help us protect our DNs. Two copies of the backup uh, anti-change counter, the Slater from set 1, as well as one copy of this new 4-5 counter, where it's a 2-5 counter, but if our opponent has a climax in play when we use the backup, we can give our battling opponent an extra 2k. So just spam the board at level 2, and just keep playing that gold bar, and hopefully that can get the job done. But if not, you can always uh, try to lean back on uh, all the all the uh, extra healers that you're playing with Emilius and Elizabeth that you can recur. So this is a, this is a pretty fun deck, but I think uh, alongside this very heavily early play deck, we do have another extremely early play heavy deck. Uh, so why don't you introduce to us this Holy Knights deck, Randall? Sure. So with the Holy Knights, we did have a lot of Holy Knight cards from the first set that I guess if you really went out of your way, you could try to make a Holy Knights centric or like mono Holy Knights deck. Uh, but with the cards introduced in the second set, they really take Holy Knights to a brand new level. Um, especially with cards like, as you mentioned, the early play play style of uh, these new cards. So before we get into that, let's first talk about some new support for cards from the first set, in particular the 2-1 Gil Thunder combo. So in the first set, he has that Bonder level 0 Margaret that allows you to grab him out of the waiting room and then simultaneously gives him a 1k buff and prevents the opponent from using counters against his attack, allowing you to guarantee his reverse and get the advantage off the Climax combo. Uh, with the second set, there is a brand new 1-0 Gil Thunder that also supports this strategy. Instead of grabbing him from the waiting room, this particular Gil Thunder has an on play. You can discard a Britannia character to search your deck for the 2-1 Gil Thunder. So this gives you access to him from the waiting room with the bond, as well as from the deck with this new 1-0. In addition to that ability that just grabs him out of the deck, he has two power abilities, one of them being a Global 500 to all your Britannia characters, and the second one, being a rest self ability to give 1500 power to a copy of your 2-1 Gil Thunder cross turn. So this allows him to be 9k power because uh, he's 7k base, goes up to 7500 thanks to the global 500 effect, and then up to 9k from the 1500. So this just makes the Gil Thunder an even stronger and more consistent engine for the level 1 game than he was before, and allows you to lead into the brand new strategies that we have from the second set. So uh, with that, let's talk about the double early play package. So we have these two new level threes, the Hauser and the Gil Thunder. And so uh, the way these work is these are a double early play package. The Hauser can be early played 
if you have the 1-1 Griamor as a child in your clock. And so uh, this can be very easily accomplished thanks to the new Deldry Brainstorm. So in addition to just being a generic tap self salvage brainstorm, which is already a great floor for a card, uh, she also has the effect where you can rest one of your Holy Knight's characters. It doesn't even have to be herself. You just rest a Holy Knight, and then you swap the bottom card of your clock with a Holy Knight character from your waiting room. So that gives you a very easy way to get that Griamor into your clock and allow him to fulfill the early play condition for the Hauser. So the Hauser, when he comes into play, you can pay one stock to grab the Gil Thunder level 3 from your waiting room and place him on stage. And uh, these two training buddies work very, very well together, uh, gaining additional power and abilities as long as you have the other one on the stage. So in particular, Hauser, as long as you have the Gil Thunder on stage, gains 2,000 extra power, bringing him up to 10k. And he gains the effect where on attack you can discard a Britannia character to choose one of your opponent's characters anywhere on stage and return it back to their hand. So a very nice disruptive ability, but at the cost of one card in your hand. The Gil Thunder, starting at 10,000 power, gains an additional 1,500 as long as Hauser's in play, going up to 11.5. And the extra ability that he gains as long as Hauser's on stage is that whenever he direct attacks, you can choose a Britannia character from your waiting room and put it into your stock. So uh, with Hauser's ability to bounce one of your opponent's characters back to their hand, you can just open up a lane in order to have Gil Thunder declare a direct attack, and then you can get that stock back. So it essentially allows you to convert one card from your hand into one card in stock while simultaneously disrupting your opponent's board. Now that being said, that isn't the only strategy that you have to go for. Uh, given that Gil Thunder's power is able to get to a pretty high 11-5, you can just use him to attack your opponent's board, make use of that high power rather than going for the direct attacks. Sometimes that is the correct strategy. And on top of that, the Griamor that is the early play condition for this package is also a level assist that you can just go ahead and slap onto your board and make the two training buddies even higher power. So um, the last part of the double early play package is Gil Thunder's second effect, where uh, on attack, you, you mill the top card of your deck, it is mandatory, and if the card that you milled is a Holy Knight trait character, you may pay two stock and deal two damage to your opponent. So. Uh, this allows you to have almost a sort of like Chica Yo play style where you're double early playing. Uh, you're making a really big impact on the board while simultaneously potentially doing extra damage. And it allows you to get quite aggressive during the mid game, especially if your opponent is unable to address your double early plays and you just get to keep them around on future turns and go for extra value. Uh, I have found that a very effective strategy with this deck is actually to go for two sets of the double early play. So you go for double Hauser, double Gil Thunder. That can be an extremely powerful level two board if your opponent is not able to address it. And uh, just because of how high impact and uh, how disruptive this package can be, um, it's quite a lot of fun to uh, see the potential that uh, this package has had to offer, especially into certain specific matchups. Uh, I know uh, one particular matchup that has been not only very fun, but also kind of a brain teaser, is uh, going up against the standby choice deck that we profiled earlier on in this video with the uh, Meliodas and Deanne. Uh, you kind of have to navigate your way through uh, things like Hexproof and addressing your opponent's high power threats. So uh, if you're looking for a deck that is able to play a very interesting and unique level 2 game, definitely look to try to... Uh, play this uh, level 2 game. Now, for our finisher, as we have not gone over our second Climax combo yet, we do have the level 3 Hendrickson, which is, of course, just a Holy Knight card in itself, uh, but also just goes very well with the double early play package for the same reason as the Arthur package that we looked at in an earlier deck, where we are using a lot of stock at level 2 on the double early play package, and because the Hendrickson combo is fairly stock light. We don't need to use, we don't need to save a lot of stock in order to utilize that. So I think that it fits into this package quite easily. Uh, now as one final note for this deck, as you guys might have noticed, we are not running a 100% Holy Knight deck. We are running a few non-Holy Knight cards in the level 0 Bond, level 1 Kings, and the idea behind this is just to add uh, a little bit of um, 
kind of the missing pieces to this deck. So the level zero bond uh, adds a bit to the deck's mill power. This deck doesn't have the greatest mill speed, but the bond definitely helps out with that. And the kings give us a little bit of options for uh, our level one game and the counter for a little bit of extra protection. Uh, more ways to defend certain cards on our board, such as our level two Gil Thunder or our double early play package. So uh, definitely a very fun deck. Uh, not being full Holy Knights is not really a huge problem. Uh, you do need to mill Holy Knights for the Gil Thunder in order to achieve his burn, but it's not really a huge problem if you miss it, as long as you're not, you know, milling Climaxes, because that never feels good. But uh, yeah, so this is just one of the very unique new, uh, like, villain archetypes. I guess the Holy Knights, they were villains before, and uh, now not so much, uh, but... Speaking of villains, we do have one more deck to share with you guys that does heavily revolve around some of the villains from the Revival of the Ten Commandments set. So uh, here's Mike to talk about his last creation that we have to tell you guys about today, which is, of course, the Ten Commandments deck. Yep, so just like how in Season 1 we had the bad guys being the Holy Knights, Season 2 we always got to have the antagonists, so this time around it is the Ten Commandments, so... Ten Commandments, just like in set one, the bad guys are all blue, so... Or, yeah, they're all blue, for the most part. Um, so, as you guys can see here, all the blue cards are Ten Commandments. If we just take a look at the deck structure overall, kind of just like how uh, the Holy Nice deck was running some off-trade cards, this Ten Commandments deck is just running some off-trade uh, cards as well, so I'll want to just briefly go over them real quick. The Galther level 0 is a double rare that we actually haven't featured yet in any of our decks, but she is, he is, featured here, um, where on uh, on death you can discard a card to top check up to 4 and add up to 1 level 1, one, level one or higher card, which is particularly useful given that this deck has a ton of really valuable level 1 and higher cards and is also incentivized to run level 1 and higher cards. And why is that? It's because of the level 1 Climax combo. So the level 1 Climax combo with the 4 pants that we do run um, is uh, on reverse. If uh, When we get that reverse, we can look at up to the top 4 cards of our deck and choose up to 1 level 1 or higher card and add it to our hand. And then choose another level 1 or higher card amongst those 4 cards and we can put it into our stock. So if we can get that reverse, we do get a plus one hand, plus one stock situation. And this card also gets 500 power per every one of our other 10 commandment cards. To supplement the kind of trying to get reverses, we have a ton of cards in 10 commandments that allow us to boost our other characters' powers. So for example, the uh, level zero, I'm gonna butcher this name, so sorry in advance, level zero, the Riri, uh, where it's a 3-5 beater, which is very large. Uh, she has a downside where all of our characters can't side attack, but her second effect is on attack. We can give one of our other 10 commandments characters 500 power times the number of our other 10 commandments. So she's a way to give power our level one uh, back row assist, allowing us to uh, top check whenever we play a 10 commandments character, giving us top card information, as well as being a global 1000 to all of our other 10 commandments characters uh, during our turn. And then finally, the 1-0 beater, uh, which features Zeldrick and his brother, I think? Where, on play, uh, we can choose one of our opponent's characters and they get they can't move uh, to memory or be bounced back to hand for the turn. And also on attack, we can choose any one of our 10 commandment characters, including itself, and give it 500 times the number of overall 10 commandment characters you have on your board, including itself as well. So all these power boost sources allow us to get our reverses really easily for our level 1 combo. Our level 2 combo, going into level 2, also is an on-reverse combo, and that's part of the 2 Stoxel package with this new 2-1 that we have, the Gallard, uh, where he is uh, 6k base, but gets 1000 per every other 10 commandments. And on reverse with the Climax combo, um, we can sack the Climax in order to salvage a character and then clean stock two Ten Commandments characters from our waiting room. And then all of our characters get this weird demerit where until the end of our next draw phase, uh, they can't stand if their level is higher than our current level. 
But given that the Ten Commandments deck doesn't actually have any early plays, this is not really an issue. And then for our final Climax combo, we do have the level 3 Zeldris. On play heal, gets 2000 if your entire board is 10 commandments, so put him up at 11,000. Climax combo with the 10 commandments to Climax. On attack, you can pay 1 and mill the bottom 5 cards of your opponent's deck. Burn X equals the number of Climaxes milled. And then also, it gets the effect where until the end of your opponent's next turn, during this card's battle, you do not take auto damage from your opponent's uh, effects. So, kind of similar to the Meliodas anti burn. This card also offers you uh, protection through being unaffected by burns on that lane as well. Uh, several other notable cards, uh, going back to the non Ten Commandments characters, we do run two copies of the level 0 Meliodas Climax Swapper. Given that we are a six pants deck, and especially since we are running three different Climax combos, it is really important to find the right climaxes at the right moments. So being a 3-5 climax swapper will help us out quite well with that. The brainstorm in this deck is also a really powerful piece. Uh, it's a brainstorm that only salvages 10 commandments, but when we play a climax, all of our characters uh, get the effect where, or sorry, when we play the climax, uh, whenever we trigger a climax that turn, we can discard a card to, to salvage a, uh, any character, which is really, really nice. And then the 1-0 Flyer Distribution event uh, offers us two different modes, kind of like how the 2-0 uh, Green event has two different effects. This Flyer Distributors event either allows us to salvage a level X or lower character, where X equals the number of our level 1 Climax combos in Waiting Room. So if we have the level 1 Climax combo, we're always going to be able to salvage it, kind of like the event package in Danmachi with the 1-0 Bell. But this card's second effect is you can pay one, and if you do, you can choose one of your opponent's characters and move it to an empty position of their stage. So, really useful effect in, to help you get the reverses for your level 1 combo. Let's say you hit level 1 first, you can use the event, pay one, drag up their brainstorm to the front row, and then you can get multiple reverses. So, on top of killing their back row, which they usually expect to just be safe forever, you get to kill it, and also you get that extra reverse off. And then the final piece to make the whole defensive theme of this Zeldra's Endgame work is the 2-1 uh, Meleskula. Meleskula. Right. Uh, support, where she's a global level assist to 10 commandments, 500 times the number of that character's level. And then her second effect is at the beginning of your opponent's attack phase, you can pay one and discard a blue climax from your hand. And if you do, you can choose one of your opponent's characters and they get minus two so until the end of turn. So, if having anti-burn and minus two so uh, sounds familiar to you in Seven Deadly Sins, that's probably because Meliodas with a new Elizabeth counter does the same thing, but this does it in a more, I would say, uh, straightforward way, because all you really need is just to have a climax in hand, and then you can assign it to any any slot you want on your on, of your opponent's stage. A very straightforward deck, I would say. You have a very linear game plan at all levels of the game. At level zero, you just want to find your level one pieces through the Galther, and then trying to uh, set up your back row with a brainstorm. And then at level two, you want to play the Stockso Climax combo and just generate even more resources, hand fix to get what exactly what you need for level three. And then at level three, you play three Eldris, ideally supported by one or two of the global level assist. And then if they're not dead from your Climax combo, you have an extremely high chance of surviving the next turn through your defensive measures of Anti-Burn and Next Soul. Um, so that does it for the six decks that we first tested for the new Seven Deadly Sins Revival of the Commandments. Uh, we will be featuring all of these decks in our upcoming gameplay videos, so don't be worried, you guys will see all of these in action. But Let's go into some final thoughts here about uh, our thoughts so far after having played and tested the set a good amount. Uh, so what do you think, Randall? Yeah, I think overall the biggest thing to come out of this set, um, just from a like macro perspective, is there's so many fun options that you can look at throughout all of the decks. Like if we just look at the decks that we have uh, profiled throughout this video, we've only used 
one Climax combo across six decks, and that's kind of crazy to think about, right? Yeah, one overlapping one with the Hendrickson, right? And everything mm -hmm. else is completely unique. Yeah, and there are definitely a lot of cards that I think we, we both feel have far surpassed expectations, and even some that might have been a little bit below expectations. So I think uh, one big example for me uh, might actually be the Escanor. And the reason for that is, while on paper the combo does seem extremely powerful, it does come with a lot of restrictions, so uh, you have to sculpt your hand with a lot of very specific things. And in addition, I believe you have to have a full board of characters in order to activate the effect as well, which uh, it just kind of makes it a little bit unwieldy. Uh, as far as cards that have far surpassed my expectations, I think the level 3 Deanne, from your gold bar list has been uh, quite a standout card. Uh, a lot of people tend to compare the card to Ruxia as it is uh, modal in a very similar way in that you can either summon a card to your stage or you can go for some secondary effect. But I think that one big factor that kind of just flew under the radar is the fact that Ruxia is realistically only able to bring out one copy of Ruxia on that first turn at level two. Whereas with this Deanne, you can very quickly go from a level one game into boom double Deanne with two cards that you brought out with her effect you can go into like a, a third copy of Deanne plus uh, Elizabeth back row or like a Meliodas plus Elizabeth and then it's just a lot that your opponent has to handle in a very short amount of time they have to really shift gears and because of the way you're able to just kind of spit out this board full of level threes uh, if your opponent isn't prepared it kind of just uh has the potential to really get out of hand so that card for me, has uh, been quite an interesting card to test against. Uh, one thing, if there's anything I've learned from my time playing Wise and um, looking at cards without actually having played them, to your point, it is that there have been so many times when I evaluated cards completely wrong and the Deanne definitely is a very standout one. The Escanor, I think I would also agree. Um, it's very flashy, but does take quite a lot of setup. Uh, there are even cards that like we didn't actually get to play in any of our lists that I still think are just like really, really potentially powerful. For example, the big one that comes to mind for me is the new level zero Escanor bomb. It's a stock, so uh, it's a it's a stock bomb. But then it's a level stock bomb where the level that he can bomb is equal to the number of Escanor copies in your waiting room. So this card can potentially bomb level threes for free. Now, we didn't get to feature it in any of our builds, but I do think that you know, these builds are definitely not the end all BR. These are just you know, a lot of uh, basically different deck ideas that we've come up with. But if someone wanted to play you know, that kind of style, the anti-meta style, there is definitely a lot of play for that in seven of these sense. One of the things that I do appreciate about this set the most is just that compared to set one, this set is just so much better in terms of different deck building options, different play styles, what you want to go for. You want to go for a heavy early play level two game. You want to go for hyper defensive Meliodas walls or the Zeldris anti-soul, anti-burn walls. You want to go for full disruption with the Escanor bombs and the new, uh, what is the the two one, um, what is his name? Nanashi, the new Nanashi, which is essentially a carbon copy of the Cart Titan two one, which is very very powerful anti-level uh, removal. All these different play styles that are essentially just available at your fingertips. Seven Deadly Sins already had a lot of very powerful foundation, I think, in terms of having powerful level zero utility effects, uh, good enough brainstorms, you have, you know, your good climax swappers, the bond level zero is always just powerful, right? But it was also, it was always lacking that extra oomph. Uh, but now with this set two, it's honestly a deck builder's paradise. I, I really couldn't have asked for much more on my end. I've been having so much fun with it. Yeah, that all being said though, uh, with regards to anti-meta options, I do think that uh, before players can really start exploring anti-meta 
styles for a deck. I do feel that um, you do have to hit a certain floor to be able to accommodate options like that. Uh, obviously, with the set being as new as it is, and you know, being brand new cards that we have never seen or uh, haven't really had anything to like reference as far as like Japanese lists or anything like that. No one's been able to do the testing so far, so we don't know where the floor is quite yet. And I feel like that's a really important factor in determining whether or not these sort of counter options are a viable choice to include in the deck, or if like the deck's performance could suffer as a result of uh, trying to include those options in your deck. Yeah, definitely. Like, th th there's, a, there's a good reason why taking the Esno example. That's a card that basically demands that you run four of him. There's a reason why we didn't include it in any of our lists. It's because we're trying to find that baseline foundation. It's for trying to find that floor, see what works, and then go from there. See what slots that we have available that we can potentially cut from you know, the skeletons of what we've built so far, and maybe we can incorporate the tech options after that. Um, but that's just honestly the fun of this continuous deck building. You know, also the meta changes over time as well. So what might be a good you know option now? might not necessarily be a good option even just a couple weeks down the line, right? So that's just the fun of it. But if you're looking for fun, if you're looking for deck building options, Seven Deadly Sins does not disappoint, honestly. It really doesn't. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think that does, uh, that does do it for us in terms of this kind of deck overview for Seven Deadly Sins, Revival of the Commandments. Following this video, we are coming up with our series of gameplay videos for these various decks you'll want to see them in action so don't miss it and we'll see you guys in our next video bye bye